thank you, Piero, again. And uh, I mean, we have to thank you once more to, because I mean, these great communities here, thanks to you and uh, the our role is this one uh, because of the friendship that as you mentioned is around the uh, the scientific uh, community i mean for for me most of the people that will uh, speak in this uh, few days are the great father of the of the group i remember the first time that I, I participated to a conference where Constantine was there and explaining me, I was still a, a master student and was explaining me the first issues about the Rankine you know, conditions and so on in, uh, in a very nice way that is still uh, uh, the one of the person that I remember with a great effort. So thanks to be here with us you typing all, all the groups that uh, saw the, the community around Piero growing up in, this, in these years. So thanks again to all of you. And uh, I think that uh, uh, I have to, we have to go to the uh, lectures. So maybe it will be typing that will go on. Uh, please typing, thank you. Well, okay. I was uh, I learned that I should chair the first session uh, this morning, so I'm so well prepared. Okay, so um, the first speaker, Professor Constantine Da Famous, uh, he uh, is so well known to us. Uh, he is a member of National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. Uh, and received many honor. But maybe more to the point is the following. Since the 19, early 1980s, Piero just decided that he lacked shockwave. And so shockwave then began to prosper in this land. And Custis had made a serious input, his entropy method, his way tracing technique, and so on. So uh, great to have uh, uh, Costa here to give the first talk. Uh, okay. Oh, that's very, okay. Very beautiful slide. Okay, so he's going to talk about hyperbolic system of balance law with steep source. No, I have my microphone here. Thank you. So it progresses. Thank you. Yeah. It's a very, very happy occasion for me. I congratulate those who conceived, they organized, they set up the, the meeting. Piero certainly deserves it. And thank you very much for including me in this uh, celebration. Uh, actually, it's um, very difficult to find things that are getting better as one is getting old. But there are some exceptions. And one is friendship. So friendship is like wine. It's getting better as it is aging. And my friendship with Piero goes way, way back. I cherish that very much. And... Of course, over the years, I have been admiring and loving Piero for his contributions to mathematics and to this institute, founding the department and the institute here, here at the university. Actually, when I started in academia about 60 years ago, uh, national schools were still alive. So you could uh, listen to a lecture or read a paper and you could tell 
that the writer was Italian, French, American, Russian, and so on. And of course, progressively with homogenization and globalization, and so this has disappeared, uh, which I regret. Now the Italian school has shown greater resilience to that. And uh, Piero is uh, a prime example of that. Uh, so I wish him 30 more years of, well, to paraphrase the well-known movie with Marcello Mastroianni, uh, mathematics, Italian style, right? Now, um, going back to my lecture, um, the first step is to remind you something that's well known to all of us, namely fundamental solution to the Cauchy problem for systems of conservation laws in one space dimension. Uh, this will familiarize you with my notation, u, the state vector, takes place in Rn, it's a system of n equations in n unknowns. It's strictly hyperbolic, the system is strictly hyperbolic. The Jacobian of uh, f has real distinct eigenvalues and corresponding set of eigenvectors. And the fundamental result is that when the initial data have small total variation, then a unique stable solution of class BV exists on the upper half plane. And the total variation for every time T is bounded by the total variation of the initial data. So the first crack to this problem was uh, accomplished by Jim Blim now 55 years ago, I assume. And then we have uh, important uh, improvements, contributions by Liu and Bresson and co-authors. Now, when I say Bresson, this is a code word for a school of prominent Italian mathematicians, right? Single word, but for that school. Okay, so uh, the question is what happens when one is dealing with systems of balance laws, you have a source term, G of U, added to that system. And the answer is that in the for a short time, nothing new happens. The same idea, the same techniques, just a routine problem. Uh, so that, uh, again, there exists a BV solution uh, uh, on some time interval, zero T, let's say, and the total variation is controlled again by the total variation of the initial data. But as you can see, there is uh, uh, the possibility uh, that the total variation may increase uh, with time. And this is a result of two factors. First of all, the source itself may amplify waves, but even when the source does not amplify waves, it may produce scattering of waves that interfere with dispersion. Uh, the solution to the problem of the uh, system of conservation laws uh, was founded on the uh, idea of, of, of Jim Glim that be because of dispersion, the total variation is under control, even though locally you may have increased in the total variation. Now, this uh, phenomenon of dispersion is disturbed by the presence of a source that may scatter the waves around. So uh, in order to be able to get a globally defined solution, one has to be able to control the variation. If for some reason, by some device, you can keep the total variation uh, under control, small, then it's a routine problem to have a globally defined uh, solution on the upper half plane. And of course, the way of keeping total variation is by imposing some restrictions on, on the source term uh, of the type that the source term has to be somehow dissipative. Okay? Uh, this is okay because of course, in most cases, the source term is indeed dissipative, but what does dissipation mean precisely in this set? Of course, the first attempt, the naive attempt if you wish, is to impose such conditions on uh, the source term that would render this row uh, exponent in the estimate of the total variation 
uh, negative. Right? And this problem uh, was answered long ago. And uh, the condition, which I would call strong dissipation, is the following. You build a matrix A by using the eigenvectors of the Jacobian of F and the uh, gradient of, uh, of the source of the source term at time zero, let's say. And you impose the assumption that the uh, that A, this matrix, is strictly diagonally dominant. Now, what do you accomplish by that? If the system were linear, this would have implied that you get contraction in L1 and thereby contraction in variation, right? And uh, well, even if the system is nonlinear, you have small total variation, this control on the total variation extends to that case as well, right? And you are getting uh, a bound on the total variation, and in fact, the total variation decays exponentially fast. This is fine, except that this assumption here that A is diagonally dominant is uh, uh, too strong to be helpful in the problems that we really care about. Uh, so in, in, in such problems, we have dissipation, but it's not as strong as implied by this assumption here. So we need to work harder. And another result in that direction is the following, what I will call partial dissipation. Uh, you assume that the system is endowed with a convex entropy uh, and that the entropy production by the source is uh, non-negative. So the source as uh, the source is uh, dissipative somehow. This is a good condition in many of the applications. Usually such systems arise when you are dealing with relaxation phenomena and for such purposes, this is not a bad assumption. The second assumption is that that same matrix that A that we had before has positive uh, diagonal elements. Uh, so we don't care about the off diagonal elements. We only care about the elements along the principal diagonal. These are positive. This also is not a bad condition. It, it, it is quite common in the systems of interest. Again, the total variation of the initial data is assumed to be small. But in addition to that, the assumption is that the initial data decay at infinity sufficiently fast. So that integral that you see here, the L2 integral uh, with multiplied by one plus x squared um, is, is small. Right. So under these assumptions, indeed, you can show that there exists a BB solution again on the upper plane, and the total variation remains under control. You can see actually that the contribution of the, uh, the effect of the uh, total variation of the initial data decays to zero exponentially fast, uh, whereas the contribution of the, of the uh, mass of the initial data, if you wish, uh, stays longer. Eventually, the total variation decays, but perhaps very slowly. Um, you will see in a few minutes uh, how, what's the process by which such a theorem is, 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 is obtained and why it does not apply in all cases. Okay, now, however, we have another, uh, another issue, the issue of uh, uh, source terms that are stiff, and the issue of the zero, zero relaxation limit. What is this all about? Again, we have the system that we had before under the same assumptions, if you wish. But now, in addition, we have a coefficient in front of the source term, a coefficient which gets very big as mu goes to zero. So mu is a parameter, the relaxation time. We want to see what happens. We have had very rapid relaxation phenomena. And we want to see whether indeed we can have a theorem that applies uniformly in the parameter mu for mu positive. So what we need to show is that first of all, there is some class of initial data, u0, for which you are getting existence of solutions for all mu positive. We have to be able to find some bound of the total variation that is bounded uh, 
uniformly for all nu. And then, of course, we're going to pass to the limit as nu goes to zero and perhaps examine issues like is the limit unique? What is the uh, nature of the limit? And so on. This is the uh, program that was uh, uh, set first by Chen, Levermore, and Liu. Uh, and of course, there is a uh, long uh, uh, tradition, a long literature discussing problems of, of that nature. Right? So the question is how the result that we had before applies uh, to systems like that uniformly new. And as you will see, the answer is it does not apply in its original form. So I want to explain why and how we can uh, redress this difficulty. And for that purpose, I'll just use a model system. Uh, it's a system which, well, governs, for instance, the oscillation of strings in, uh, uh, in three-dimensional space or the uh, propagation of a plane, of a plane uh, wave in uh, three-dimensional hyperelastic uh, material. Uh, it, uh, it's a system of two n differential equations. And for n equals one, it is the system that's well known to many of us here, uh, the system that governs the uh, gas flow through a porous medium in, in one dimension. So it's this. Uh, type of, 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 of system that I want to discuss and see why the method that said before does not uh, apply uh, uniformly new and how this difficulty can be resolved. Uh, in that direction, we already have a result, but for a very special system. And there is, of course, a contribution by the Italian school, very strong here. Um, is the special case of n equals one and p of u, which is the special function of one over u. The old hands in hyperbolic conservation laws call that the Nishida assumption, the Nishida condition. So in that case, indeed, uh, we do have estimates that uh, on the total variation that are independent of this small parameter mu. And this said, uh, a result of the fact that for that particular system, uh, the total variation does not increase under wave interactions and also does not increase after the effect of the source term. It's a very, a very special situation, but it works well. And years ago, we have these parallel uh, solutions of this problem by Amadori and Guerra on the one hand, and then by Lou and Natalini and, uh, and young, right? But uh, now I want to consider the general case. And first of all, uh, I want to state the result. So I, I consider the, uh, this problem here uh, under the following assumptions. Uh, the initial data here, there's a mistake, unfortunately, here in, in the assumption. In front of this, I should have placed the factor one plus x squared. So I want that uh, the initial data and their first derivatives are in L2 uh, weighted by the factor one plus x squared. So this implies, of course, total variation, but a stronger assumption than total variation. The ideal, of course, solution of the problem would have been by just assuming that we have uh, uh, initial data is total variation. Okay, so uh, these are the basic uh, assumption on the initial data. And under that condition, uh, as we will see, we do have indeed a control, the total variation of solution that's independent of mu. Uh, and we can uh, perform the steps that I said before, existence of a DB solution in the upper half plane, uh, passing to the limit through uh, subsequences to the zero relaxation limit. Here, the zero relaxation limit, of course, is trivial, is, is zero. So there is no problem of uh, discussing uh, uh, issues of uniqueness and so on. Okay, so uh, I'll try now to explain uh, how one can get, to, can get to that result. 
Well, first I should have made already the following uh, remark. Uh, when faced with a, a system like that with a factor one over mu, then of course the uh, initial uh, temptation is to scale mu out by rescaling x and t, right? Uh, this would have worked very well if in the previous theorem, the only requirement of the initial data were that the total variation is small. But uh, in addition to that, remember, we also need that the total mass uh, in L2 is also small. And under the rescaling of coordinates, of course, this becomes enormous. So this is why the scaling does not work here if one wants to use this approach. Right? Perhaps in the future, somebody will have uh, a different approach that only requires bounds on the total variation. Then there is no problem. You can rescale and get rid of this small parameter mu. Now, let me explain how one would have attempted to solve this problem by the method that I said before, which I call the distributional dumping. You will see why. And why it fails if you try to do it uniformly in the parameter mu. So uh, the reason that what I, strong, I said before, I called before strong dissipation does not apply to this system here is that, as you can see, the second equation indeed is dumped by this term, but the first equation is just a conservation law. So the idea of the distribution of dumping is to perform some change of variable that redistribute the dumping more equally among the two equations of the system. Right? And now, such a change of variable is not uh, a local change of variable, it's not possible. Uh, 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 unfortunately, you can see that indeed, the, the, locally, the variation may, may, may increase, no matter how you measure it, no matter how you try to change the, the state vector. On the other hand, you, uh, you try to take advantage of the fact that perhaps because of dissipation, the total uh, variation is under control. And, um, so you have to involve somehow the, 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 the whole of the solution uh, in order to do that. This is uh, in the same spirit as Glimpse method, in which you know, we don't have a, a decrease of the variation uh, under wave interactions, but you have some kind of functional that tells us that uh, the total variation is under control. Right? So you try to do something similar, but in a different way. In other words, to find a change of variable that it is global rather than local. And as a result, it redistributes somehow the dumping. And this is very simple in the context of this, of this system here. That's how the general theorem that I stated before is proved. It's a, something that works in general. But here, it appears like a, an explicit, simple trick. Um, so what you do is uh, you introduce this potential uh, capital phi that you can see here, and you perform the change of variables. You replace V by the variable Y, and then you end up with the system that I have here in the bottom. You see in that system, the, uh, the uh, dumping has been now equally distributed between the two equations, so this is good, but at the same time, you have a new source term appears on the right hand side, this one over four mu times five, right? So uh, on the one hand, everything is fine, but then you have somehow to find, uh, uh, to, to control the total variation of, of this term. Now, the total variation of phi, you see, is given by this uh, uh, L1 norm of u multiplied by one over mu. So somehow you want to find a bound of this, of this term here. Now, for fixed mu, it's possible to find such a bound, right? By using, for instance, either some entropy uh, estimate, which works for vacation equals one, or some kind of Lyapunov function that originated with uh, Denny, uh, Denny uh, Serre, uh, but uh, 
for the case of uh, uh, the case here, you can see that we have uh, one over mu. So it's not possible to have a uniform bound on this on this uh, on this term. For instance, for very small t, uh, the L1 norm of, of u is of the order of magnitude of the L1 norm of the initial data and multiplied by one over mu goes to infinity. So this is the challenge, how to beat this difficulty, right? We would like to make this, the, if possible, the initial data for u to be zero, all right? Um, or, or of order mu in a certain sense, right? That, that's, 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 the, that's the goal. So how can you, how can you accomplish that? Okay, so you try to, to solve this problem in the following way. Uh, you partition the uh, state vector in two parts. First, you partition the initial data in two parts, uh, which I call uh, P0, W0, Q0, X0, and so on. And uh, P0 and Q0 are mollified forms of U0 of uh, of U0 by using a mollifier of the type you can see over there, some function H of mass one, uh, smooth, uh, non-negative, and symmetric. The fact symmetric is, is very important here. Right? Things that not work if it's not symmetric. Now, under this, you see what you know about the initial data. Of course, uh, P0 and Q0 are very smooth, so they have derivatives of all order. But of course, beyond the first order, derivatives uh, increase uh, with respect to mu, right? Is uh, 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 you can see here, unfortunately, it's not easy to point out, but you can see here that uh, second derivatives increase like one over mu square, and the third derivatives from mu to the fourth, etc. right? Same thing about q. Uh, on the other hand, the other uh, component, W0, X0, and Psi0, which is what's left after this modification, uh, stay in the same function class as the initial data, but now, of course, the, the initial values are small, right? Because most of the initial value has been absorbed by P0, Q0, and, and uh, Phi0, and so on, okay? So now you partition the state vector accordingly into components P, W, and V as R and Z and so on. And now here is, of course, the problem that uh, took a lot of time to, 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 to understand. Uh, the first component uh, uh, here, P, uh, is selected as a solution of a parabolic equation uh, of the porous media type, right? This is a system that it's uh, a generalization of this porous media equation. The fact that the porous media equation is somewhat related to problems like that is well familiar to, uh, to our community here and uh, Piero himself, Ron Hua and so on have uh, certainly contributed to that. They're experts in that. So you choose P to be a solution of that uh, equation here, and you choose R to, as I indicated here, and then you find out that uh, W and Z, the remaining components of the state vector, satisfy a hyperbolic system like the original one, but of course, let's see. Yeah, it's not very easy, yes, right here. So the same, same nature as the one that we had before, except of course more complicated because we have of course uh, terms that are introduced uh, from the other component of the solution, right? So treating the first system is no problem. The initial data are extremely smooth. It's a parabolic problem. The existence of solution is no problem. The difficulty, of course, is to see what is the effect of these extra terms uh, imposed on, on the hyperbolic system. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is to get some a priori bounds on the solution of the parabolic system. 
And here I have a list of the bounds that are needed. It's important to see how various functions of, of that solution behave uh, uh, with respect to the small parameter mu. You see some of them uh, don't depend on mu at, uh, at all. Some of them uh, uh, increase like one over mu, one over mu square, and so on. You need all these a priori estimates in order to proceed. And it's not difficult, it's a routine matter to prove these estimates. They all come from energy type uh, estimates, uh, except that one has to be very careful to find exactly how these uh, bounds depend on mu, uh, because it turns out that in the end, uh, this, this very precise dependence is, is, is indispensable. If, if you miss it, then you cannot, you, cannot, uh, you cannot proceed. OK, so first you go through this uh, tedious, tedious exercise. And then uh, you try to get the, your target is to show that the L1 norm of W decays like mu. So one over mu times the L1 norm of W remains bounded. This is the, this is the, the uh, result that you try to, 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 to get. And you're getting this by establishing an L2 type estimate of this type. Unfortunately, I don't know how to work directly with L1. I have to go through L2. Uh, in order to get an L1 bound. And I need this uh, weight factor here in order to pass from L2 to L1. This is what in induces this, uh, these problems here. So the question is how to get an estimate of this type. And this is obtained by using, uh, again, L2 estimates. And it's very long and very tedious. Uh, uh, here I have tried to indicate how you start to, to get estimates of this type. Uh, you see, I have, you have to get, um, you have to, 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 to get the time derivative of this term and the time derivative of that term and the right derivative of that term. And each one of these gives you a two page uh, uh, estimate somehow. It's a very, a very long uh, and tedious exercise. But if you play your cards right, in the end, you end up with the estimate that I want to get, namely this one here. Right? You remember the redistribution of damping before failed because I needed exactly an estimate of one over mu times the L1 norm of one of the components. This is exactly the estimate that I need if I were to work with the new system. Unfortunately, if I try to work with the new system, this is fine. In other words, this difficulty is all right. But you have another difficulty, namely that uh, this last term of the second equation, this term here, the total variation of this term is not small. Right? So you, you still need another kind of uh, transformation that will render this small. So how do you do that? Uh, did I skip something? Oh, OK. I, I, I have rewritten the system here. It's the, this term here that gives me, gives me trouble. So I perform still another change of variable. In other words, I replace z now by new variable x, which is defined the way I have defined it here. It looks mysterious, but actually it's not. After having struggled with a month or two, things come very natural in a sense. But you really have to, to struggle in order to, 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 to get the motivation. But in any case, the end result is that now, for the same w, you have a new system, a new variable x, uh, which is here. And this is tamer now. Uh, this term here, theta, which is given by that, has a small total variation. You see that you have one over mu in front of the dissipated terms. 
and one over mu here on the right hand side here and there, we can scale now this mu out and we are reduced exactly to system that we can, that can deal by the methods that I said before. And that's what gives us the, the final result uh, of the, of, that's how the, the theorem proves, right? So I was tortured a lot in order to go through all these calculations and estimations. I don't think I should torture you as well. So I think I will, I will, I will stop here. I hope you got some idea of the thing. Uh, happy birthday, Gero. And this is for you. <laughs> you see about uh, another That's Italian true. mathematician of very old times. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. It's all so smoothly like a sonata. But, uh, <laughs> I, I need to start with this more. I <laughs> cannot even come up with a question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any question? Okay. Uh, I should put the, yeah. the last one, <laughs> the first one that. Or oh, at least uh, this is recommended by the manual of a uh, good professor. <laughs> but, uh, no, I... See, another problem with age is hard hearing. So speak loudly. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I will return to the usual Marcati that speaks loud. <laughs> he, let me just uh, now th there are ma many simulations in your talk that uh, somehow are familiar with the piece of things uh, I saw in my in my life and but uh, what is uh, in my opinion something that uh, I really would like to understand because in your argument there is an interplay with certain moment with the entropy the entropy plays a role you construct this entropy in order to get the L1, but really it's somehow an unusual way to, to go from... Uh, uh, it, do you have uh, some physical interpretation in terms of a thermodynamics uh, hided in this argument uh, that would explain why you get somehow read? I wish I had. I don't think a thermodynamic uh, uh, issue in that case. Uh, uh, in other words, it's not a, uh, perhaps it's a physical issue, but it can be decided only after one takes, for instance, a very concrete case, like the case n equals one, and understand this splitting of uh, variables. Of course, we know that asymptotically, as t goes to infinity, uh, it is the this uh, porous media equation no, no, sure. this, that governs this, the thing. This is the center of the so game. It's the same equation, it seems here, that governs what happens in a very short time uh, after the initial data are imposed. So somebody who is better than I with uh, scaling may be able to interpret and even simplify this thing. As I told you, the naive space scaling, get rid of new, does not work by just uh, rescaling the variable, but more sophisticated scaling perhaps uh, would give us some insight of why, why this thing works. But I don't have the power <laughs> of doing it. Right. So I had to, to go through this estimate, keeping new in the picture and uh, seeing exactly how new enters each term. And it works in the end, but very precisely. He had, as I remember, a, a glimpse, you know, scheme argument, a different scheme argument that deals with second order equations that 
right? Very similar to that because you can reduce that. Yes, okay. So it's just uh, the, as in the hyperbolic case, I study the interaction of traveling profiles for the, for the, the, the balance law. So it's a different uh, approach and I don't use any at all. Yeah, so the, uh, I think, so the, uh, the, there are basically are these three uh, features uh, for this problem. The first one is that, uh, so it's, first of all, so the principal part is a hyperbolic. So therefore, so they are uh, for BVE, so you, uh, what you're trying to uh, basically uh, to check in the uh, total variation, you need uh, basically first order scheme, pretty much. So it's a finite type propagation. And they are, uh, however, so they are, uh, they are uh, the leading order of the solution. So they are uh, explained in a time asymptotic, it's given by a diffusion. So the, the diffusion profile, if you chase in time evolution, so that it's need a second order. So it's actually increasing uh, in time. So they are in the first order scheme. So that's, uh, that's why, uh, so the leading order need to be uh, uh, spelled out. And here, so that's a third actually difficulty is that, so they are a singular uh, parameter. So that's uh, the third one. So they are basically, so they are sometimes uh, some, uh, in, in some phenomena, so it is not uh, the, uh, the, like uh, what Costa said. So that physically, so it's not uh, the phys physics is, is uh, difficult. It is how we understand it is difficult. So it's uh, basically, so they, this happened actually in many places. See, for example, in the, uh, like in Landau damping things, it's also the uh, leading order actually making, uh, making trouble. So you have to uh, have to spell it out so that after you spell it out in an accurate way, and then the remainder actually somehow is uh, controllable in the uh, by the standard approach. So this is uh, this this is basically uh, what I want to say about this. Thanks. Thank you very much for the answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no other comments, let's uh, thank Custis. Okay, now is the period for free discussion. We come back 11.30.